Okay, so we're going to make a start. Welcome, everybody. Uh, this is a public forum on the U.S. elections, the role of media and opinion polls. It's a Yes, this is a discussion that is necessary and very much warranted in an institution like ours at the University of the West Indies and also in a country where the U.S. elections were so avidly watched by so many and with such profound implications. We watched the ups and downs from the primaries of an election that took about a year and a half, almost two years, from the primaries through to the election on the 8th of November. And we also observed the conduct of the media and of the opinion polls in the course of this period. And while it is the election, while it is the, the opinion polls and the media that will form the centerpiece of our discussions this evening, it is inescapable that we will perhaps also weigh in the balance the conduct of the election itself, and then, and in that context, the performance of media and the polls. It is, I believe, common, commonly held that this was one of the most confrontational, aggressive, perhaps vulgar election that we have seen anywhere and surely in the United States for a long time. We had candidates threatening to lock up others. We had uh, a number of kind of reactions and responses of their supporters which did not so much present this election as the global model of democracy, which sometimes we expect elections in the United States to be. But it is said that democracy is not a tidy affair, and that in the US, like everywhere else, there are aggressively contending parties. As I've indicated, media figured front and center in these elections. Many media houses picked winners, whether implicitly or by formal endorsement. Many opinion polls made predictions, and the great majority seemed to have got it wrong especially in, in respect to the electoral college results and the eventual winner of what many have called the most shocking election outcome in living memory in the United States. So these are many of the issues that will come into play as we discuss these matters this evening. We have a stellar panel to help us unpack the outcome and the media performance leading up to the election. We have over there on my, what is that now, my right, <laughs> Mr. Don Anderson, 
He is a pollster and certified management consultant. We have Mr. Claude Robinson, media specialist and commentator. We have Mr. Earl Moxham, special assignments editor at the RGR Communications Group. We have, and we are happy to welcome Ms. Delia Harris, who is a, a dramatist and a Carrimac graduate student and a specialist in culture and the study of cultural issues in Jamaica. We also have Ms. Jennifer Sutton, who is from the United States Embassy and who has kindly agreed to come and to present here this evening, not so much as one of the panelists involved in the cut and thrust of the debate, but someone who we have asked to come and to let's give us an overview of the US election system, electoral process, so that that will form a context for our discussions. So I want to go directly into that part of the discussions. We'll ask Ms. Sutton to make her presentation. And now that we have introduced the members of the panel, I'll just ask them to, to return to the audience area because of the slide presentations to be done. And then they will return when we have the Q&A section. And we'll come up individually for their presentations. So let us welcome the panel and welcome Ms. Sutton to her own uh, presentation. Thank you so much to Karimak and uh, to Professor Dunn for inviting us here tonight. This is uh, very exciting for me. I'm uh, very interested in, the, in politics and uh, very happy to be here this evening. So uh, my, my presentation, I was asked to cover the elections process, the electoral college, um, state and federal law, and then within that I'll talk about absentee ballots. Okay. So, uh, in general, in order to qualify for the ballot as, as a presidential candidate, um, the most obvious way to qualify is to be a party nominee. And as you know, in the United States, we're dominated by two parties, much as you are in Jamaica. Um, and, but each candidate needs to qualify in each state. So, um, so that, is, that is the main way that that happens, and I'll, and I'll get into that more in a moment. Um, you can also be an independent candidate. That's a lot, of, a lot of the third party candidates that you hear about that maybe got a couple of percentage points in the election. Um, they usually need to petition, uh, get say 100,000 signatures in a state in order to qualify for the ballot in that state. And so it's, the barrier to entry is much bigger because they have to try that much harder uh, to get in. Um, and then there's also of course write-in candidates which very rarely, even in local elections are successful. Um, that's more at the local level. You can't write in for presidential election, but, um, but they're very rarely successful. Okay. Um, with political party involvement, um, uh, parties have to nominate their presidential candidate. And so it varies by state. We have 50 states, obviously, in the United States. Uh, in some states, the uh, presidential candidate party is picked by um, through the primary election. In some states, it's picked, the candidate is picked through the caucus. Um, the reason that, that parties prefer, I think, the caucus method is because then, for example, a Republican can't come vote for the Democratic candidate in a competitive race that they would prefer to run against, that kind of thing. In order to vote in a caucus, you have to pledge your membership to a particular party. Um, so parties will have uh, organizing meetings at the legislative level within the states, at the state level, and then obviously you are all familiar with the national conventions uh, that they have where they formally, each of the elected delegates, at each level you're elected as a delegate to the next level, and then that's when they formally nominate the candidate. Uh, delegates are pledged to vote from one candidate over, over another, and the number of delegates are allotted based on generally how many votes are cast for each candidate. So 
in Hillary Clinton versus uh, Bernie Sanders, for example, uh, they would have been uh, allocated, if one got 70%, the other got 30, that's how they would divide up the number of each delegate that they would send to the national convention. Okay. And then, um, so the other, the other part, the other role of the parties in an election is really the parties are doing the hard work all year long. I mean, the election season is very exciting, uh, but uh, the, the parties are the ones that build the foundation at the local level. They know, they know who the volunteers are. They know, um, they know where to go to knock on doors. They know what the resources are. And so they are the ones that maintain the foundation that then when there's a campaign at any level, they can come in and build on that um, organizational foundation hopefully to, uh, to succeed. The Electoral College is something that is somewhat, you know, recently and, and in previous uh, presidential years, um, confusing, and, uh, but it has a strong foundation in, um, it, was, it, was a, it was subject to much debate in, by their founding fathers. Uh, there's a sense in our constitution and our laws of wanting to be fair and wanting to balance power. That's why we have the three branches of government that are, that are fairly well uh, balanced in power. And originally, the Founding Fathers wanted Congress to just elect the president. Uh, but they, there was some opposition to that. They didn't want the executive to be beholden to the group, to the legislative branch, right? That obviously would have some sort of influence. Um, and, and ultimately, um, there was also concerns that uh, that one constituent group would have more power than another. So for example, when they were talking about this originally, slavery was actually still in place in the, in the United States. Free, free states uh, outnumbered slave states by 60 to 40%. So the South was not particularly pleased with uh, the idea of a popular, popularly elected candidate. Um, urban, uh, you know, the rural areas wanted to make sure that they could balance their power against r rural, against urban areas. Um, let's see what else. And in large states, you know, California, for example, dominating my home state of South Dakota. <laughs> um, nobody really cares about what South Dakota thinks except when it comes to the Electoral College and how those votes are cast. Um, there was, it, uh, at one point, a deadlock with the electors, which is a nice, interesting piece of trivia, in 1800 between Thomas Jefferson and Aaron Burr. And so that's when they cast the, uh, they passed the 12th Amendment to our Constitution saying that they, electors needed to, to vote for each person separately. Uh, there are 538 electors, one for each senator and representative, and then they added three for Washington, D.C. So in order to be elected president by the electors, they need 270 uh, votes, an absolute majority, to win. Electors cannot be federal uh, representatives. Uh, they are elected by the party members. So generally at the Congressional District Caucus, they'll elect their elector. Um, and they, that person is not required under federal law to vote the way they say they're going to vote. They have, it's not unprecedented for an elector to be faithless, is what they call it. Um, but some states have uh, passed laws um, uh, with criminal penalties. Nobody's ever been prosecuted. Uh, and then parties, of course, exact pledges from folks to, to vote the way they, they um, say they're going to vote. So, uh, so the popular vote after election day uh, is determined who won. You know, you, you watch all the coverage. So and so won Illinois. So and so won Alabama. Um, and then the Republican elector, if, if the Republican won Alabama, those elect those Republicanly elected electors. Would, would go the way of the popular vote in 48 out of 50 states. In two states, they um, do, do it, uh, they would portion uh, the electors out by congressional district. Um, under state and federal law, I'm, I used to be a political fundraiser, so I know way too much about campaign finance. Um, <laughs> Uh, but, but state and federal laws both govern reporting around who is giving money and how a campaign is spending money. Uh, they cover if, for example, I 
am a scuba diving organization and I really want to support the environmental candidate, I can spend a bunch of money uh, supporting them so long as I don't coordinate with the campaign. I can, I can do it all independently on my own, um, and, but that would all need to be reported as well. Um, uh, so there's stringent laws, it's all public information. You can generally look online and see who's given money to whom. There are limits on, on how much an individual can give, that a certain amount for the primary, a certain amount for the, for the uh, general. There is some public finance funding. Every, day, every year when we pay our taxes, you can give a dollar to the presidential you know, um, campaign fund, but it's, it's not very much compared to how much money people do raise. Uh, election dates are set by law, uh, so the Constitution actually sets the, the presidential election date as the first Tuesday after the first Monday in November. Uh, <coughs> and in states, it's generally, it generally follows the same, although I just came from Washington State and they have four or five elections a year, and so those are just mandated by the state. Um, but they, so I understand in Jamaica, the legislature can vote to postpone, for example, local elections, and that isn't something that would happen in the United States. Uh, states also control voter registration, so in some states you have to have a certain amount of residency before you can register to vote. Um, in some states you can, if you just drop the ball, you can register on election day, which is great for, for someone maybe who forgot or for a student or, or whatever, but, um, but some parties have an interest in not letting that happen, so some states don't let that happen. Um, some states you have to have registered by a certain date to vote in a certain election. So those are all controlled by the states. States also determine, for example, if a prisoner who has served their time can vote again because their, their right to vote is taken away while they're in jail. Um, and that can certainly influence an election. They also uh, determine how votes are cast. So again, for example, in Washington State, it's 100% vote by mail. So you have like two weeks to vote, right? You get your ballot and you can just send it in whenever you want. Other states say we'll open it 7 a.m. and close at 8 o'clock. I think California closes at 8 o'clock. So, <clears throat> so that's all determined by the state. And that, and that impacts, right, so like everybody waits for presidential election for California's polls to close <laughs> for their predictions to see, see what's coming. Um, and also they govern absentee voting, right? So I as a diplomat voted from Jamaica. Um, if someone is very elderly or ill and they can't go to the polls, uh, they can vote absentee. Most states are very, you just have to register. It's very easy to do that. And then um, also states control the gerrymandering, which I don't know if that's a familiar term to you or not, but every, <laughs> these guys know. So every, every 10 years, right, they, they redraw, they, they look at the population and they adjust the boundaries of the congressional districts and also the legislative districts within the states to adjust for population shifts, right, because every congressional district um, should only represent, I think, 900,000 people or so is what they want. And so, for example, some states might lose uh, a, a member of Congress if they've lost that much population. Washington State just got a new congresswoman in 2014. We created a new congressional district, so, um, but they draw the lines. And so you might have a majority Democratic state, but because of the way they've drawn the boundaries and the districts, um, the, you know, the majority, the, the majority of the outcome will, will be in favor of, of, the, of the Republican Party. So certainly that, that can have a major impact on the election. Um, and I think that concludes my remarks. I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ms. Sutton. During the Q&A, we could pose some questions once you agree to answer them. But for now, I think we have a better understanding of the electoral system in the United States. And we are going to now proceed into our, our panel discussion of the role of media and the opinion polls in this election just concluded in the United States. Our first presenter is Mr. Earl Moxham, Special Assignments Editor of the RJR Group. He also uh, hosts the That's a Wrap program and uh, at the Monday's International Week that was. Much more to say about Earl, but I know he is widely known 
already in Jamaica. So your time, Earl. Please welcome him. Thank you very much and good evening. Well, one of the first things that struck me from years ago about the U.S. election process is that it's a very long one. So we have had to be paying attention, certainly here in Jamaica, in terms of what I do on a Monday morning uh, on television and observing what happened in the United States in terms of media coverage. It has essentially been nonstop for the last two years. You will not be surprised, actually, after President Trump is inaugurated in January, if days after you hear speculation about who will be the candidates for the next election. And so it is a never-ending uh, process, actually. But it certainly gets more intense, say, halfway through a term, and then you begin to see persons jockeying for positions, especially if you are a member of the opposition party, the party not having a candidate in the White House, at that, uh, a president in the White House at that time. But certainly in respect of how this last election was covered by the electronic media, uh, my own observation, and I say this without trying to adopt any kind of holier than though attitude from a Jamaican perspective or a Jamaican media perspective, um, but I really felt that in terms of how the U.S. electronic media, and let's start specifically with television, how they covered the election, I thought that it left a lot, uh, it was found wanting significantly. I believe that too much of U.S. television coverage was driven more by the ratings imperative than actual top-class journalism. I believe that too often what we saw, what we got on, the, on network television and on, and on the cable um, channels was the talking heads and the discussion about the latest outrageous statement that came from the campaign trail. And as a result of that, one did not get enough of an opportunity as a viewer or a listener to delve into some of the real issues that were affecting constituents across the United States, issues which ultimately might have determined the outcome of the election. At another forum last week, I pointed, for example, to the fact that from way back in 1999, November, I happened to have been in Seattle, Washington for the so-called Battle of Seattle when they had that World Trade Organization meeting. And there was quite a backlash even then against the forces of globalization. We in 2016 perhaps saw the eventual outcome of that in terms of impact on an election outcome in the so-called Rust Belt states. Those states that have lost so many manufacturing jobs, states that were traditionally reliably democratic states, but they swung the election this time to Donald Trump, partly because of his promises in respect of closing the door on many aspects of international trade deals. My criticism of media in that respect would be twofold. One, television journalism did not sufficiently focus on those felt experiences and needs of ordinary, Jamaica, um, ordinary Americans. Now, as a consequence of that, we did not get those long form stories that delved into these experiences of persons in Michigan and in Pennsylvania and in Ohio, for example. I will say this for the BBC and BBC Radio in particular. BBC Radio did deploy its reporters to go into some of these communities and unearth some of these personal stories. And I think you therefore got a better sense by listening to BBC Radio, and I speak specifically of radio here. You got an, an, an opportunity to hear a little bit more 
of what that, norm, that ordinary American citizen was feeling, experiencing, and expecting. I also believe that newspapers and magazine writers did a better job in terms of those long form stories. I do not believe that there was enough of that. Um, I hardly see a news reporter doing a report on CNN anymore. What you get is an anchor summarizing an issue for the day, and then he sets loose, or she sets loose, uh, somebody for the Trump side, somebody for the Hillary side, and perhaps a professional commentator from a university or somebody like that um, in the middle. But you did not get that opportunity to, to really hear um, much in terms of those felt experiences in some of these communities. Now, in terms of the, 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 the approach that was used in some instances, I also have a problem with what some may call the danger of false equivalence in reporting. And let me just go to one of the textbook definitions of um, false equivalence. It says it's a, lo it's, it's a logical fallacy where there appears to be a logical equivalence, usually in quantity and quality of evidence between two opposing arguments, but when in fact one side has substantially higher quality and quantity of evidence. It says journalists use a form of this logical fallacy when comparing two sides of a scientific debate in an attempt to provide what they think is a journalistic balance between the two sides, but the, prepar the, the preponderance of evidence is on one side. And I'll cite you an example in respect of the debate on climate change. The evidence, the preponderance of evidence points to climate change as something real, happening, and a, a, a serious threat to the future of mankind, including us here in Jamaica, of course. But in order to present a picture of balance on that uh, matter, sometimes the programs will go out of their way to present somebody whose arguments have no basis in fact to provide some kind of balance. In the election coverage, there were many instances when Let's face it, Donald Trump said something outrageous, something untrue, something that could easily be rebutted. But rather than investigating this matter, they found somebody to defend the indefensible and somebody to counter that from a logical perspective. And I'm not sure that that kind of journalism is good for anybody. Now, while saying that, I am not for one moment saying that the Trump candidacy should not have been objectively covered. And some journalists, as it turned out, did go out of their way to be in collaboration with the Clinton campaign, as it turned out. That is not the kind of journalism of which I speak. I am saying that you must, as difficult as it might have been, for some persons, as challenging as it might have been for some persons to cover uh, Trump, you would still have to apply the same standard of journalism that you would apply to anybody else. If you follow that rule, then objectively, you would still be providing the sort of uh, clarity that is needed for the coverage of an election. And I think that they fell down in some instances where that was concerned. So I really believe that there was a lot uh, left in terms of the lack of absolute professional coverage from the electronic media of the campaign. I do believe that uh, some of our print colleagues probably did a better job, perhaps because of the changing nature and the demands um, on television uh, in the United States, I think to some extent they got it wrong. They did not do as much as they should have done. I also believe that there's a danger, there was a danger then, the danger is even greater now, of normalizing the rise of racism in the United States again. Racists now feel emboldened once more to be openly racist. 
I think it is the duty of journalists to call it when they see it and not provide an open field for racists to resume propagating that nastiness in the United States. So when on CNN, for example, somebody from the so-called alternative right wing of American politics makes an outrageous comment that he is not even sure that a, that a Jewish, someone who is Jewish is a person. And CNN then runs that at the bottom of the screen without more. It gives some sort of legitimacy to that comment as if this is something that is part of the norm, that you must accept this as an argument that you must objectively consider. That is nonsense. And there is the danger of a lot of what is subnormal becoming normal or being normalized deliberately or inadvertently by how the media covers President Trump going forward. Thank you. Okay, so thank you for those remarks, Earl. Uh, we are gonna unpack some of that and see where we stand. We're gonna now invite Ms. Delia Harris to come and to make her remarks against the background of the full spectrum of media that we are talking about here today. Good evening, everyone. Um, I will, no, Al, oh, yes, specifically today be talking about the impact of social media on the presidential election. And for the purpose of this presentation, I'm defining social media as computer mediated technologies that allow the creating and sharing of information, ideas, and other forms of expression via virtual communities and networks. I just want to go through some data and some information that I found very, very interesting as it relates to the presidential election. Social media is proving to be one of the most effective ways to target specific demographics and to influence voters. Earlier this year, a survey of U.S. adults showed that nearly half of U.S. adults have turned to social media to obtain knowledge about their country's election. 44% reporting that that is where they learned about the election. Um, so with this in mind, it's hardly surprising that they dubbed the 2016 election the first true social media election. Statistics also show that 63% of people felt the quality of information about candidates and political issues was better on social media than the quality of content produced by more traditional media outlets. It speaks a little bit to something Earl just raised. And then 40% of users on social media have participated in a political discussion or they've affiliated themselves with a candidate. Because what social media does is it allows voters to connect with candidates on a personal level. Um, they're not just looking at them through the CNN and not being able to ask questions and respond and get feedback to the things that they're saying. And the best way to gain momentum is not necessarily about image anymore, because Trump's image wasn't the greatest. Um, the campaign really was about personality. So although the scale of social activity during this year's elections is unprecedented, I want to say that this isn't the first time that social media was used tactically during a US election in order to drive home party message and candidate support. And there you have Barack Obama, interestingly, first presidential candidate widely acknowledged to harness the power of social media and he pumped 47 million into digital ad spend, which was 10 times the amount of his Republican rival, Mitt Romney. And if you look at the figures, um, they're almost incomparable. Obama with 20 million followers, Romney with one, um, Obama doing approximately 10 original tweets per day, Romney three to five, and then when you get to Facebook, 29 million likes, 
Romney, seven million, almost eight. And um, 1.4, talking about this, and we'll talk about um, what these things mean a little bit later on. Facebook, since then, now boasts 1.7 billion monthly active users, which is up a 60% from 2012 when Barack first entered, when the previous election took place along with Twitter seeing a 185 million user influx compared to 2012, rounding the number of monthly active users up to an enormous 385 million persons. Now, um, this was 2015, again, Earl said, you know, already people are starting. From last year, I want you to make note that the most followed presidential candidates were, of course, these four, and I want you to look at where Trump is in comparison to the others. So when you look at social media, it, it, it was a head start that he never gave up until the very end. So in March this year, the New York Times stated that Trump had earned just shy of two billion in free media coverage compared to the 10 million actually spent on bought media, which has now been reported um, at the end of the election to have been increased to 17.3 million. Um, Clinton has a share of around 40% in sponsored content, while Trump only comes to approximately 20%. The San Francisco Chronicle said the U.S. public spent collectively 1,284 years reading about Trump on social media. And if he tried to seek similar attention by buying ads, the reach would have cost him $380 million. Clinton garnered around 100 million in free exposure via her social media activities. So when you compare the performance, it becomes even more visible that Trump had a good instinct on how to drive his online success because he wasn't only relying on sponsored content. The political newspaper, The Hill, says social media's influence in this presidential election is stronger than it has ever been and that it will shape campaigns for years to come. The Wall Street Journal says traditional media and the Democrats and the Republican parties have lost dominance of public opinion to the digital revolution. Now, how have they done this? Facebook became an active space. And among the examples, Bernie Sanders had a group organized on Facebook that closed down a planned Trump rally in Chicago in March 2016. Um, the Trump campaign created a cartoon animation with Clinton repeating her now infamous line about super predators, and he paired it with the text, Hillary thinks African Americans are super predators. Then they used the ad in dark, quote unquote, Facebook posts, um, both targeted and paid posts to convince black voters not to come out for election day as to whether or not it worked. Um, that's still yet to be determined. Clinton's campaign launched a digital hotline on November 1. More than 50 staffers and volunteers, as well as voting rights lawyers, were available to answer questions, and it was open to everyone, not just Democrats. And the campaign claims it had around 70,000 interactions with voters through the hotline, and part of why she launched that was because they recognized that there, there would be voting irregularity, people would have issues, and so the hotline was a way in which people could get answers quickly and she could get the votes moving again, becoming an active space. So the effect of the Facebook algorithm, Earl, back to what you were talking about, the algorithm that controls your newsfeed, and it favors content that you've liked, matches your own priorities, so you will find that people that have a particular political alignment, um, you've now brought all of them together and you've mobilized them. So racist America now found a way to find other like-minded people and to kind of you know, ensure that the, the messages that they were trying to send were coming through Facebook. People were advocating for candidates on social media, the millennials especially, because this generation makes up a large percentage of the market share. They're not out picketing and campaigning and putting tags on cars. They're on social media doing the lobbying. And they're, they're referred to as the new modern day lobbyists. Bridget Coyne, senior manager of Twitter, says, no, you can add a poll 
to ask your followers a question and they can answer it. So some of the tactics, tweet storm, where people will reply in succession. So you just have this robust stream of tweets. So if you say, what, what did Trump just say? You'll see a feed just filled with responses. Um, you can't even hardly respond to them or provide feedback. And then there's also the bots. And these are fake accounts on Twitter that are pre-programmed. And there's a recent study that found that between the first and second presidential debates, one third of pro-Trump tweets and almost one fifth of pro-Clinton tweets came from bots. Um, and they said the bots reinforced this sense of polarization in the atmosphere because they are not mild-mannered. I've had to deal with some of them when I've said anything that they don't like about Trump. I've just had to be blocking them, blocking them. So we get to the memes, and we would have been used to them here in terms of political cartoons. Now with traditional media, you'd have the cartoonist putting out one image. With the memes, um, social media, the users are the content providers. Lots of memes, I just picked um, a few, and you'll find that one of the things is for Hillary Clinton, the memes would reinforce um, that she was not necessarily a leader that could be trusted. Um, so these stupid people are actually going to vote for my lying ass, and then it depends on what your definition of email is. Um, and a leader that you can't trust is better than a leader that you think is probably not competent because you probably feel that somebody can help him as opposed to somebody who's going to tell you a lie. And so you found that Trump's memes tended to be a little bit more, I mean, when you see them, you laugh. Foreign policy, mess with the United States, and there will be hell to pay, laughing at his hair. Trump is not destroying the Republican Party. He's simply revealing it. But you didn't find anything much that really would say, you know, don't vote for this man because you can't trust him. You can't. Yes, they brought up the bankruptcy. Yes, they brought up other things. But I think in terms of how it, the image of both candidates, it did more harm to Hillary than to him. So we know earlier platforms on social media were used to establish presence. Um, now Twitter, since the past two presidential um, campaigns, has morphed into a place where candidates make announcements. And it's kind of a battlefield where they slug it out every day. Um, Hillary told Trump, delete that tweet. Um, so it's used more like a persuasive tool and people are arguing because they're trying to win this argument on Twitter. Another thing, Earl, was um, Trump used social media to counter traditional media. And this is just an example of him going at media. So one of the things he did was he used social media as an alternative space. So there was a Facebook live stream hosted by his advisors, um, broadcast by Right Side Broadcasting Network. And as of September this year, the channel has more subscribers than MSNBC's YouTube channel. Um, on Reddit, which there's a pro-Trump sub-forum, they actually had to reconfigure that space because there was so much Trumpism happening on it that they couldn't control what people were seeing because the more common things that came up were the things that went into the news feeds. Um, so Trump broke the, the, the site-wide record, 113 beating the previous record of 95. I'm almost done. In April 2016, Clinton, correct the record, they announced a program called Barrier Breakers, which was intended to rival the largely online volunteer efforts of Sanders and Trump. So Facebook was becoming an, and social media this alternative space to traditional media. So when you looked at the presidential candidates across all media, um, Trump clearly ahead in terms of Twitter followers and Facebook likes. And that's very important when it comes to social media interaction, what you say and how many people respond. So back to what Earl was saying about Trump being outrageous, the more outrageous he became, the more interaction he was able to secure online. It didn't matter if he went outrageous and then when people came, he would say, okay, I'm sorry, I didn't mean that. The fact is he pulled them to where he needed to have them. And some of these sites, once you like them, you're stuck there unless you're going unlike them. And so you end up in this constant discussion outside of a filter bubble that you would have normally had with algorithms that puts you into this broader conversation. 
So Clinton posted 221 times. She had 9 million interactions. Trump posted 223 times and had almost 20 million. Um, so even though she increased her profile by 100%, he was so far ahead that when he increased his by eight, there was no catching up. So um, that's the information that I have so far. If you have any questions later on, I'll be happy to respond. Thank you. Good, so we are just over halfway there and a lot of issues already on the table. Was the writing for Trump already on the wall through social media that the mainstream media did not see? We're gonna ask an, a mainstream media analyst, Mr. Robinson now, Claude, to come forward and to make his presentation. Mr. Claude Robinson. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, um, as you know, the word the, for 2016 from the Oxford Dictionaries is post-truth. And in politics, in case you don't remember or didn't look it up, post-truth is a political culture in which debate is framed largely by appeals to emotion disconnected from the details of policy and by the repeated assertion of talking points to which factual rebuttals are ignored. And of course, post-truth, although it was not, uh, the word was not coined in 2016, came into great prominence in 2016 because first the Brexit and then the US election and the way that played out. Now, it's, it's I, I'm not, you know, I don't like words that are hyphenated and when I'm not quite sure whether post is the prefix to truth or truth is suffix to post. Uh, so, <laughs> I wish it were a word without a half nation would know what post-truth is, but anyway, <laughs> and post the truth. So it's how we feel rather than what is real, what is, it, is factual. And that in a great, ex to a great extent characterized much of the reporting for this particular uh, election. The first point I want to make is that the press got it wrong. I mean, and I include myself in that, I got it wrong. And you see here, one of the New York Times readers wrote to the paper's editor saying, you were so wrong for so long, you misled your readers and were blinded by your own journalistic bigotry. Remember that word bigotry again? That was the New York Times used for somebody else. <laughs> and then, the readers came back to the Times with it. Michael Moore, as you know, one of the uh, well-known filmmakers on the left, again talking about the mainstream media, you were in a bubble and weren't paying attention to your fellow Americans, and therefore the so-called liberal media establishment was in that situation, in, in, seen in that way. Now, the, so the second point uh, about that I really want to, to talk about is that the large majority of the US mainstream newspapers in their editorials um, supported uh, Hillary Clinton, the vast majority. In fact, I could only find a handful, maybe four or five, supporting um, Mr. Trump editorially. There are some papers who were supporting um, the Democratic candidate for the first time, the Dallas Morning News. Um, the, Arizona, uh, the Arizona Tribune 
Chicago Sun Times, the Arizona Republic, sorry. And the Arizona Republic was, for the very first time in its history, supporting a Democrat. The Dallas Morning News from Texas, for the first time in 75 years, supporting a Democrat. The Chicago Sun Times, breaking with its own rules of not supporting um, a candidate supporting Clinton. USA Today, which has never supported an, a candidate in its editorial, broke with its own tradition and supported Hillary Clinton. And some of you might have seen the editorial from the Miami Herald, which was perhaps one of the shortest and most telling editorials I've seen. It had a photograph of Mrs. Clinton and a photograph beside a photograph of Mr. Trump, and the caption read, her, not him. Enough said. That's the entire editorial. <laughs> On the other hand, of course, we know that the New York Observer, which is owned by um, a gentleman called Jared Kushner, who we recognize as Mr. Trump's son-in-law, the Observer New York supported um, President-elect Trump, unsurprisingly. Now, so with all of that said, it still didn't work out the way they had pro um, 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 projected. I want to go back a little bit to the um, primaries and to make some comments really based on a, a study done in June um, by Harvard Business School. And among other things, they found that journalists were easy, went easy on Mr. Trump in the, in the primaries. Remember the primaries before you have election day. Um, they tend to ignore Bernie Sanders because he was of no moment. And also the press was fixated on scandals around um, Clinton. During that period, when the focus of positive news coverage was primarily on Mr. Trump because he was a celebrity, he was getting attention, and also a lot of the press did not take his candidacy that seriously. In fact, the Huffington Post, for instance, started out covering Trump in the entertainment section and only later on put it into the political section because it was a star operating in that sphere. Clinton, we will say here, got the most negative coverage during that period of time. And there are some numbers there that are, that are interesting about the negative com coverage that, uh, that she got. And this is a summary of, of the pro-Trump favor favorable rating coverage by these mainstream media, USA Today, um, Fox, the Los Angeles Times, Wall Street Journal, CBS, NBC, Washington Post, New York Times. Um, all of them were covering Trump favorably in the early stages um, of the race. Then Mr. Trump became a serious candidate, and then there was a kind of a switch. And this here summarizes, in a sense, Trump was beyond the pale and they no longer had to observe the normal rules of journalistic of journalism and, and objectivity and went after Trump in that way. And that's a comment by Chris Wallace of Fox News. And Chris Wallace said, I thought the New York Times was one of the worst offenders. We were all guilty, myself included, of writing him, him off. And as you heard from Dahlia, while the mainstream media was writing him off, he was engaging with the voters directly. Now, Don will come back and tell you why the, um, why the, why the pollsters got it wrong, all right, depending on what he, what he comes up with, so I'm not going to get into, into, into that area. But there are some people who felt that in some cases, there was a, a late swing to um, Trump. Some people felt that the 
intervention by FBI Director Comey towards the very end. It may not have a direct influence, but it did certainly, what it did was to energize the, um, the Trump campaign and push the Clinton campaign on the back foot. So rather than um, going forward in that last push to look for, to say, vote for me, she had to be saying, I'm not a crook. And that's a different narrative from saying, you know, vote for me. So whether or not the, 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 that, that had an effect, we're not sure, but we certainly know that it had an effect on the campaign and how the campaign was seen and reported in the, in the press. But what's interesting though, more than, and I said, Don will talk about the, the polls, so I'm not gonna go there. But what's interesting for, for my presentation was that the, the polls influenced and drove reporting, um, particularly in the area of what is sometimes called data journalism, where, you know, you remember like the uh, New York Times had their upshot uh, on their, on, on the, both in the paper and online, where they gave you daily um, uh, pr 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 predictions or projections on where the, how the race was and how to turn out. This was based on the analysis of polls and using big data and all kinds of algorithms. And the New York Times upshot model, uh, on average, had Mrs. Clinton with a 71.4% chance of winning. The Huffington Post model had her with a 98% chance of winning. Princeton Election uh, Consortium had her with a 99% chance of winning. Now, what all of these, these projections, which are not explained, et cetera, uh, meant was that the journalists and other, others clicked onto their model of choice. So if you see a model of choice, if you're on the left or the right or whatever, so your model of choice, and you click onto that model and you see uh, Hillary Clinton with a 90% chance of winning the election, we're into October, coming into November, you're seeing those numbers. Um, then you feel good, your supporter is, is your, your candidate is winning. The, the model really was also influencing re re coverage even in ways that are ha ha difficult to understand. So that in the case of the, um, their database, of a post database, um, using polls, information from more than, more than 30 polls in which um, Trump did not lead in one of those 30 polls. And their analysis of those 30 polls gave Clinton a win of six, point, uh, six points or more in the state of Wisconsin. Trump took the state by 1%. So that you had 30 polls in one state saying it's gonna happen. And so when you are analyzing that and you see that kind of result, it bolsters your reporting, your analysis, your coverage, and your editorial comments about the race because you are being driven by your analysis of data. Um, Dale mentioned about um, all of what was happening on Facebook, so I'm not gonna go there, and on social media, except to make one point about the role of fake news. Um, so we, we had traditional news, we had social media, and as part of social media, we also had fake news. So you had um, fake news that the, um, about the Pope uh, supporting, and you also had fake news about George Soros um, saying he's going to unleash whatever it is on black people. Now, and therefore that was to discourage um, a very important part of Hillary's base, the black voter, from turning out. Coming to the end, Prof. 
in summary, a couple of things. It seems to me that mainstream journalists did not understand the breadth and anger many Americans felt towards the established political order, including mainstream media, mainstream political parties, and the mainstream Republican Party, because remember that Trump was an outlier in the Republican Party. Trump, I'm not even sure if Trump is a member of the Republican Party yet, but uh, <laughs> let's, <laughs> maybe, maybe he's by now. But, but mainstream media did not get, get it right about understanding the breadth and depth of that anger. Um, they were driven by their own skepticism of Trump's chances of winning, which was driven, as I said, by the poll numbers and the analysis of those um, polls. And as one of the New York Times editors said in a re reaction afterwards, journalists and journalism did not do a good enough job of being on the road talking to real people. In addition, I think journalism also failed in not capturing apathy because apathy played a significant role in Hillary Clinton's loss, particularly in, this, in the states of Ohio, Wisconsin, Iowa, and Michigan. In all of those states, key demographics that were democratic did not turn out to vote. If you look, for instance, at the turnout in 2016, the estimate as of now is 58% turnout. And at the same time, the press was presenting this election as almost Armageddon. It was such an important thing that everybody had to go and vote. Now, 58% was just a little bit more than the 57.3% that turned out for 2012 um, in a re-election year for a sitting president and therefore less enthusiasm and far less than the 60.4% uh, or the 62% or the uh, that turned out in 2008 for the first Obama election. So if you look at the difference between that 68 62% turning out for Obama in um, 2008 and 58% total to turning out in this time, and particularly in the key battleground states of Ohio, Wisconsin, Iowa, and, and Michigan, which I've looked at, had, um, had apathy not played a role in those persons not turning out, th it, it might have been different. So, final slide going forward. Um, This so, sort of summarized what we've, we've been saying. Um, it ran counter to every, every forecast. Um, the voters demonstrated how much predictive analytics and election forecasting in particular remains a young science, and journalists ought to go back to the world of reporting about candidates and issues. They need to pay more attention to observation and reporting reporters on the ground. Show less reliance on data journalism and prediction models. And remember that politics is a human activity. Data analytics can predict it. It's sometimes about how people feel. And as I, co I ended the quote from The Economist a newspaper, the main responsibility of political journalists is to write about the candidates, their proposals, and their fitness for office. Guessing the outcome of an election is a secondary activity. And we in mainstream media need to remember that. Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you very much, Claude, for those thoughtful remarks. I think each presenter has added new value as we have proceeded. And uh, we still have one uh, presentation to go. 
and that is where we are going to be making the emphasis in this last presenter on the polls side. But before Don comes up, I just wanted to, to remind Claude that perhaps in the, in the mainstream media environment, the key word was post-truth, as you indicated. But in social media circles and in certain other circles, the key word was bigly. <laughs> bigly. <laughs> it's interesting that you spoke about The Economist, because that magazine that calls itself a newspaper had on its front page, just leading up to the election, a cross your finger sign and a picture of Hillary painted on the front of the finger. So that was already a clear message, perhaps, somewhat contrary to their own editorial um, commentary. Afterwards. <laughs> afterwards, <laughs> afterwards, which is always 2020, that kind of vision. So we turn next to Don Anderson, who is a well-known pollster, market research specialist, doing media, media research studies, and also a lecturer here at Carrimac part-time in research methods. So Don, your turn. Let's welcome him. Thank you very much, Prof. When I came and I realized I was batting last, I said, you must be trying to save the best wine for the last. <laughs> but having listened to the three presentations that went before me, I must tell you that I am humbled by what I heard. I have so much information that came from all three presenters that um, I took copious notes at every stage. <laughs> so I think probably the most talked about issue from about 10 o'clock on the night of November 8th was, so what happened to the polls? How did the polls get them so wrong? Polls and political pollsters have been taking a beating over the last few years. And I cite a few, the British elections, the Scottish elections, Brexit, the Jamaica elections <laughs> of 2016, and the US presidential elections. Indeed, so in a way, damning have been the articles and comments about polls and pollsters since the 8th of November. That questions have been asked about the future of the business. I was on a radio program on RGI, I believe, and it says, well, so done. Are polls done with now? I said, definitely not. Can pollsters ever be relied upon again? I said, absolutely. Why did the pollsters get it so wrong? And I believe I have some answers. If indeed they did get it wrong, that might be a controversial statement. Is the science now in doubt? And I say no. A, poster, a person giving pollsters the wrong answers or the right answers, well, we never know. But as a pollster myself, I have to try to objectively assess what are the answers to these questions. Whilst at the same time, asking the question as to whether the pollsters did get it wrong. And I will look at it from a, obviously a scientific and a very statistical perspective. So let us look at the US elections. Several notable networks and polling outfits predicted a win for Hillary Clinton. With rare exceptions, none of them had her winning comfortably. None of them had her winning comfortably. And in, indeed, virtually all of them had the polls ebbing and flowing, especially over the last three months. And as someone who has placed a considerable amount of emphasis on looking at the trend, because the trend data is really what is used as a predictive tool. You can't do a snapshot at a point in time and say this is how an election is likely to go. So I have been very much focused on the trend, and particularly the last two or three months of a campaign. 
So we want to look at what some of the polls actually said. I have done a fairly deep analysis of something like 171 polls done by various establishments and polling outfits during the September, from 1st of September through to the 6th or so of November. Very much in line with what um, Claude and others have said, 88% of those polls, 171 polls that I've evaluated, conducted by a wide range of polling outfits, 88% of those polls had Clinton winning by varying margins, and the average was 4.5 percentage points ahead for Hillary Clinton. 12% had Trump winning by varying margins, averaging two percentage points. And we want to look at a few of them. Fox News, had, which is a generally a pro-Trump station network, had Clinton winning by four percentage points. Ipsos, Reuters, had Clinton winning by three percentage points right before the election. But interestingly, a month before that, the Ipsos Reuters polls were averaging a win of five percentage points for Hillary, down a month before the election to four percentage points, and down just before the election to three percentage points. So we talk about the value of trending. CBS had Clinton winning by four percentage points. NBC, perhaps the largest of the major networks by six percentage points. ABC Washington had Clinton two months before the election winning by 12 percentage points, narrowing down to five percentage points, down to four percentage points. Interestingly, there was one station, I'm not quite sure who these are, IBD, but I pulled them out because they were the only polling outfit that had Trump consistently ahead. They had Trump ahead initially by one percentage point in October, and by the time elections came around, they had Trump winning by two percentage points. They were obviously an anomaly, so people thought. Taken as a group and factoring for the margin of error of between three to four percentage points, and in some cases, five percentage points, depending on obviously the size of the sample relative to the overall population from which it was drawn. And the fact that Clinton appears to have won the popular vote by about one percentage point, I ask the question again, against the background of the projections, 171 different polls, which had her winning by an average of 4.5 percentage points, she eventually would, would have won the popular vote by one percentage point, not unfortunately based on what we heard earlier, the electoral count, but certainly the popular vote. So had that been the, the basis, perhaps we had a different situation, but of course it's not the basis. So when you look at that kind of discrepancy, if you wish, between what the polls were saying, an average of 4.5 percentage points for Clinton, ending up with one percentage point ahead, we have to take a little closer look at the situation. I posit something else. The analysis post-election has shown that had Hillary Clinton won less than one percentage more votes in Florida and in Pennsylvania, she would be the president. Very interesting statistics. Had she won less than one percentage more votes in Florida and Pennsylvania, she would have won enough votes in the Electoral College to become the president. Very interesting data. The fact is, polls have been so accurate over the years that, we, that they have been re relied upon very heavily to project the outcome, and I say project the outcome of election, not predict, but to project science rather than. The recent events have shaken that confidence in polls. 
the international environment, I believe, not just all of us in Jamaica. I remember being at the U.S. Embassy, or not the embassy, but at the, the um, election night um, analysis as the results were coming in. Uh, and somebody, not me, did a poll amongst the persons who were there. And I believe it had something like 91% of persons present saying that um, they wanted Clinton to win. So again, all of that is very much in line with what we have seen in terms of the emotional attachment that was evident where perhaps most of the international community wanted Clinton to win. This emotional perspective, as in my view, added to the condemnation of virtually all the pollsters coming so soon after the Brexit vote, which again had most of the pollsters coming out on the wrong end of the actual outcome. Questions have been raised, and I have raised questions my own self about the methodology being used in most of these polls. Certainly in the more developed markets, the tendency is to use telephone interviewing. And the big question that I have really has to do with the representativeness and hence the reliability of drawing samples based on telephone interviewing. Because whereas I believe in the United States and more developed markets, they have a reasonably good frame from which to draw a telephone sample. They are inherent challenges in executing a poll using the telephone. I'm going to do a lot more work on this, but I believe two things that come to mind readily is that when you use the telephone approach to actually contact an individual, there are questions as to whether or not this particular individual is representative of the state within which the interview is conducted and therefore whether that person is really representative enough to be projectable to the overall population. But the other one that comes to mind, and I don't see, have not seen anywhere where validation of those telephone interviews has been a critical factor in determining whether or not people are giving you absolutely correct or right true answers. I say so against the background of what we do here, because whilst we do, do a lot of telephone interviews for business interviews because the frame from which you can pull those samples is reliable enough. We have a telephone directory and most businesses will want to be in the telephone. So we know that a representatively and a reliably drawn sample will give us the ability to project accurately upwards. What we do here, of course, is more door-to-door, face-to-face interviewing. And a critical component, a critical component of what we do is a validation procedure where we go back and we randomly select X percentage of the persons that were interviewed and we cross-check the answers to make sure that persons are in fact giving us consistency in terms of the answers. So the question is out, the jury is out about the degree of validation that the frequency with which telephone interviews are done in the United States, whether they do allow time for that kind of validation and cross-check. That's a very important thing. But the fact of the matter is that nine out of every 10 polling unit had Clinton winning the election, and she didn't. So we may ask the question again, well, why? I have some perhaps non-poll issues that would explain that. First of all, as I, and I see some similarities, by the way, between the Jamaican election and the outcome, and the US election and the outcome. I will make quick mention of them. I've consistently made the point on every occasion that I talk about the results of a particular poll when I say that, you know, the polls are great, and if you're doing a good job, then the polls are a re reliable measure of how the elections are likely to turn out. But I've made one consistent point throughout, and I want to make it again. Elections are won on election day right, on election day. Having said that, the data indicates that between 10 and 15 percent of the persons who voted in the election on November 8th made up their minds within the last week of the campaign, between November 1 and November 8th. 10 to 15 percent of those persons who voted. 
So what did we have then? Going into the election with all the poll results that were being um, uh, released would have been a factor, a number of persons who said to the pollsters, I don't know who I'm going to vote for yet. Not sure whether I'm even going to vote. And therefore, the projections would have been made on the rest of those persons who said I'm either going to vote for Clinton or for Trump. But that there would be a residual factor of about 12% of persons who did not give the pollsters an answer one way or another. It tallies and correlates to that 10 to 15% who made up their minds how they were going to vote or if they were going to vote in the last week. Data that I've looked at also suggests that we're talking about looking at some exit polls that a significant percentage of that 10 to 15 percent who made up their minds in the last week decided to vote for Trump. And also that a very large percentage of that 10 to 15 percent decided not to vote. And the question was, and it's jury still out, as to whether or not the large majority of these were Democrats or Democrats inclined voters who did not go to vote. And again, I see some similarities between the US election and the Jamaica election here. Another important factor which is going to be subject to scrutiny and obviously more research would need to be done on this was the revelation in the last 10 days of the campaign by the FBI of more emails. And Obviously, for it to be scientifically sound, one would have to do a correlation between those persons who made up their mind in the last week, 10 to 15 percent, and those persons who might have been influenced by the revelations of the FBI 10 to 15 days or 10 days before the election. There is a school of thought, and Clinton Hillary certainly believes so, that the revelations hurt her chances of winning. Now, when you think in terms of the, the reality, that less than 1% more would have given Clinton the pre presidency in two of those key states. When you think in terms of the potential impact of the revelations by the FBI within the last 10 days, um, you, you really do have to kind of do some more work, but the jury is still out as to whether or not this might in fact have been the tipping point. There's another similarity that is not, has not been really emphasized or made much of. But in a campaign speech three days before the election, and here's where I draw another parallel with the Jamaican situation, Clinton is, not Clinton, but Trump was reported as saying in part of his campaign, he's going to put money in the hands of every American. And I remember the 1.5 million um, in a couple of days before the election in Jamaica. Um, you know, the bottom line is that where you have two candidates who, as one person said, I am going to vote for the candidate I hate least. In other words, no, neither of the two of them were great candidates. They all had their kinds of baggages one way or another. Trump with his financial dealings, Clinton um, by virtue of being I what I call the market leader. Uh, market leader is generally more, more, most vulnerable because the market leader is there for people to throw darts at. And the market leader, by virtue of her being the secretary, being out there having issues against which she could be, or for which she could be attacked, Trump didn't have those. And again, it's like in the Jamaican context where when you talk about scandals and, and, and the impact of scandals, I have enough empirical data to suggest that scandals don't affect how people vote. You could have 10 of them running on a trot. What people say is, well, I want a house as big as that too, you know, all right? Or I'm sorry I didn't get some of the, 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 the graph. In that context where Trump's biggest challenges were how he ran his businesses and so on, who really cared about that? People are saying here's a successful businessman, and perhaps a successful businessman could really run the country. But there are certain central themes that I think destroyed the, the validity to a certain extent of the polls, right? One of the things that, and again, is how he used the media, both social media and formal media, Trump had one consistent message throughout, which resonated 
with a lot of Americans. First of all, when Trump started, everybody, as you rightly have said so far, didn't give him much of a chance. Here was a man who was just really frivolity and was going to be entertainment. But from the outset, Trump was saying some things that as the data, as the elections have shown, were some of the things that Americans have wanted to say a long time, but nobody dared to say it. Trump stood out, he said it, and in the final analysis, the central theme of his campaign was, I am going to make America strong again. This is something that appeals to the rank and file of Americans because they've always felt that America must be and ought to be the strongest country in the world and we, we should dominate. So this appealed to a significant percentage of the American electorate. Clinton, on the other hand, didn't have any such central theme around which people could hang their hats, or on which people could hang their hats. So what it boiled down to, as Trump really did a lot of marketing, and politics is about marketing, not about politics, it's about marketing. And Trump did an excellent job marketing, as we saw in the social media campaign. But the most important thing, one of the most important things he said was, again, where you placed emphasis on this trust factor. So in a situation where you have one candidate who you are constantly saying, can you really trust this person? And that resonated a lot with the Americans. The FBI issue 10 days before reinforced this whole issue of, can we really trust? And I believe certainly that the election which was trending towards Clinton in all the political polls, was lost in the last eight days of the campaign leading up to, to um, the election day on November 8. So elections are won on election day. I believe that certainly in the, in the more enlightened and um, maybe more developed markets, pollsters will have to review how they do their work, how they get the information from the electorate. That's a key factor. And I believe that it will clearly have to bear the scrutiny. I think they'll have to go back to the drawing boards. But again, as we have said, when you look at the projections compared to the actual result on the popular vote, they really weren't all that way out. And if you consider the margin of error, they were within, except they were all on the wrong side. <laughs> right. I thank you very much. Okay, so we've heard from the presenters. We have a moment now to ask a few questions. We are inviting them back to the platform. And we are asking you to indicate if you want to ask a question, say who you might want to direct it towards, and make the question as concise as possible. We ask you to avoid too many double-barreled questions. Yes, yes. Mr. Moxham will have to go after about 10 minutes or so, so perhaps if you have questions to direct at him. But the floor will now be open once um, you indicate that you want to ask a question. I was quite intrigued by the presentations and just to rem remark on the last one, so it perhaps was hanging around the popular vote in relation to the pollsters, that things might have been made a bit complicated by the Electoral College. Scandals don't have a big impact on people's voting. <laughs> Very interesting, Don. <laughs> and Trump really won by marketing. Uh, OK, so questions, if you would. Please, come to the microphone, or you have a microphone with you? Oh, microphone will come to you. Good evening. Um, my name is Akila Marin, and I'm a graduate student at Costa. I actually have, oh, sorry, at UE. <laughs> I have two questions. Um, one for Mr. Moxham, and one for Mr. Anderson, so I'll start with Mr. Moxham. Understanding that media organizations are ideally businesses and they are profit-driven, um, 
How would you suggest that they strike a balance in reporting objectively and reporting on what their audiences are interested in while improving their ratings and by extension their profits? Because you said that a lot of the media houses went on social media. It was based on likes and what was being shared and so they went with what was popular and so they kept going on sensationalism. So how would a media organization strike that balance? I think I'm constrained to speak from the perspective of a professional journalist. Now, the suits in the boardroom down the corridor might have a different opinion, but certainly in respect of my obligation or the obligation of a newsroom, I don't think that we can take into consideration the commercial advantages to be gained by reporting in a particular manner. I think our obligation is to truth and objectivity. And therefore, I, I would say that the journalists in these many newsrooms across America ought to have stuck to that obligation. They might have had a terrible fight behind the scenes with their bosses, but if they gave in to the profit imperative, then I think that they would have failed in their responsibilities as journalists. I'm not unmindful of the need for the business to be profitable, but as a journalist, that can't be my consideration in respect of my job. Thank you. Okay. And for Mr. Anderson, Mr. Robinson in his presentation indicated that um, the, the polls drove reporting, but on the morning after the election, Mr. Trump's campaign manager said that they relied, they ignored the polls and they relied heavily on the silent voter. And what I'd like to know is, as a pollster, when you have a situation like what we've seen in the US election, where the spiral of silence was definitely there, that you had persons who would not openly say they were Trump supporters because of the prejudice that might be attached to them for supporting him, but on the election day itself, they allow their voices to be heard. Is there an algorithm that factors that in as a pollster? Is there a way to factor in the fact that in situations such as what we've seen in the United States, that you will have a great majority of persons who either will not say who they're voting for or who would give a false statement about who they're voting for because they don't want that prejudice attached to them? Okay. First of all, First of all, I don't think it's a great majority who would have concealed their, their opinion. Um, I think certainly some persons did. I think it really came to the fore in this particular election because there was, there was a, a, greater, a much greater emphasis on the personalities and the persons and who they were and what they did and didn't do rather than on the issues. And I think from that perspective, there were persons who probably, again, didn't want to say outrightly that they were going to support Trump because of the kinds of negatives and baggage that he carried into the campaign, but who shared a lot of his ideals. And perhaps from that perspective, you did have a relatively small percentage who would have been so motivated and driven by that kind of reservation about declaring up front who they were. But I don't think that that by in itself would have necessarily influenced and been a tipping point. So, the floor continues to be open for questions. Good evening, uh, Anthony Frampton. Uh, actually, um, just to preface, I actually don't think that this election was an election about class. To me, this, this election was more about underlying issues of multiculturalism in American society, that of race, xenophobia, misogyny, bigotry, and so on. And <laughs> there was also an underlying issue in which the Democratic Party was also going through a particular transformation in terms of its progressive side of its politics and its more conservative sides of its politics, whereas the, the Republic, Republican Party was at a stage where it needed a resurgence and it was getting it from Trump's narratives. My question is, and I'm going to go back to 
question that was asked was whether pollsters may be having problems in polling issues that are more taboo in society and whether that in itself may have affected, one, how they approach the polling, and secondly, how they interpreted the data that they received out of the polls. Okay. Go I assume that question is for me. <laughs> <laughs> I would think so. <laughs> um, first point, the, there were no clear lines in terms of either class or social standing or or ethnicity, or those lines were not very clear. If you look at the way in which the data came out in the final analysis of how people voted, right? All that happened was that few of the Afro-Americans voted for Clinton than did vote for Obama in 2012, right? But for sure, Trump appealed to the rank and file of the middle class, the belly of the American people. Not necessarily the issues, because if we follow the debate, there was really no emphasis on issues per se. It was all about cutting each other, about who was going to send each other to jail and who was going to do so and so. So I believe that for the first time in that I have watched any of these debates associated with the American election, there was a sharp deviation from the pattern where issues were the paramount sort of focal point and where personalities really came into play. And unfortunately, um, Trump won that game. I say unfortunately. Other panelists may want to comment on that. Lord? Thanks, Chairman. I, I believe that part of the, my response to the question, I think it's a very important question. I said two things. First of all, Trump engaged on those issues. Um, I mean, the expressions of, he, he, he used xenophobia, bigotry, misogyny, all of these things, he, groping women, all the things he said about himself and, and so on. And, they, and, and brought into the conversation the so-called alt-right, who were people who used to normally wear sheets and don't know wearing suits. Um, therefore, talking into mainstream politics. And, and one of the problems that, that I have with mainstream media, I don't know about the polling side, mainstream media did not engage a serious conversation about those racial and other kinds of issues. What they were talking about was sort of like, um, you know, the, the sensational aspect of it. You're talking about a candidate who for, the, for years denied the legitimacy of the first African-American president. And we don't have a conversation about that, about those things in mainstream media. And, and so that, um, those issues did not emerge the way I thought they would have emerged. And secondly, I believe that people who embrace those extreme views uh, that were being expressed by the alt-right and now in, in, the, in the public domain would have, might have been reluctant, in my view, to actually tell pollsters that they're going to vote Mr. Trump because if they if they'd said that, some of them would be, then be seen as fa falling into Hillary Clinton's basket of deplorables. Now, uh, and, and, and therefore, they did not want to be seen those ways, so they stayed home, they quietly ignored the questions, and then, because it's a small enough number of persons, that one or two percent, but given Florida, Wisconsin, um, uh, Ohio, one or two percent would have made that difference um, in society. I think it played a role, but my point is that mainstream media did not engage the issue as much as they, as, as they might. Okay, uh, Delia? Um, just one of the things I wanted to raise is that there is a concept of a filter bubble on social media. Um, it really c speaks to the fact that the conversations that you have and how you engage don't take into consideration the other conversations that are happening. And so because racism may not be an issue for you. Um, you may find that someplace else within, within the Trump camp, it is a major discussion that's overlooked because you're in a filter bubble um, based on algorithms that present information that are of interest to you. 
And I think um, one of the things too is gender. Gender was, was a huge part of this campaign. Hillary being the first potential female candidate, but also Trump coming across as just this sexist man. And when you look at um, the figures in terms of, the, there was a particular incident where they, he said, if you weren't a woman, um, nobody would be looking at you for president. And then she said, well, if dealing with women's issues is playing the woman card, I'm going to deal me in. And after that whole conversation about the woman card, and if you look at um, just the, the statistics of who began to follow them and who would unfollow, then you realize that a lot of things happened done. Um, it, it was very dynamic. It wasn't a matter of I'm going into this campaign and I'm supporting Hillary or even Bernie. When you looked at some of Bernie's followers who were also following Trump, the statistics say mostly men switched to supporting Trump after Bernie was no longer a part of the campaign. So it really was a lot more dynamic, I believe, um, because of social media than we are willing to give the voters and Trump credit for. Okay. Sorry, I have a follow-up, sorry, if you don't mind. Yes, um, please. Because my concern is that yet 52% of white women voted for Trump, right? 98% of African-American women voted for Hillary. 80% of African-American men voted for Hillary. 70% of Hispanics voted for Hillary. On the question of whether Muslims should be registered, 37% of Hillary um, supporters supported the registration of Muslims, right? 36% of Trump supporters supported it. That's one percent, so Hillary supporters 1% more than Trump. And 27% of Bernie supporters supported the registration of Muslims. My issue is, I think it's an intellectual dishonesty in the mainstream media, Claude, that this notion of class, this was not a class uprising. This was not a class revolt. If it was a class revolt, what happened to the 98% of African-American women who are the, as a group, as an ethnic group, who is, the, who is the worst performing group in the United States? So, I mean, you have to bring in this, the, the primacy of race into the argument. It's an uncomfortable thing to do, but I think it is telling us directly that if it's one theory that the election has shown is that um, at least white Americans have the tendency to openly denounce racism, but privately execute certain plans that bring it into, into the fore. That's my point. So I don't know if there are any further comments, but I think the, uh, Dr. Frampton um, made his point very clear about the role potentially that race played and the business of class also. Uh, other questions? Yes. Martin Henry, public commentator. The press has been assigned a certain role in democracy. I haven't heard in the analysis a sort of assessment of how well it stood up as the fourth estate. Um, it, we have uh, seen how social media functioned, the shortcomings of mainstream media, but what of the future in terms of informing people about democratic issues, about the functions of government, as part of the deal of making democracy work. And Mr. Markson, before you go, how well do you see Jamaican media living up to the prescriptions you have made for the demands of reporting and covering election campaigns? Are we doing better than the Americans? <laughs> but also, the first part is also important. Um, for the future, is the press going to play a critical role of helping people to make rational decisions, or are we going to see the sort of um, catfights and endorsements which you described so effectively this evening. Okay, so Earl, perhaps you could start. Yes. By the way, fortunately, I've just got a message that um, I can stay a little bit longer, but to, <laughs> <laughs> to, to your question, I, I think I noted it at the start of my critique of the American media that I was not 
in doing so, claiming a holier than thou position for the Jamaican media. And let me emphasize that now. I do believe, however, that there is still a greater emphasis, generally speaking, on ferreting out some of the backstories within the Jamaican media culture still. It is true that we get drawn in by the color and the circus of the campaign trail. And too often, for my own liking, there's too much of a cascas without the substance that we need to get into. I am not particularly optimistic that we are going to do much better in the future because I think our own media culture is perhaps tagging, tagging along too closely to some of the external influences. I maintain that we need to do more in terms of long-form reporting, in terms of even sometimes, Celia, picking up on what is emerging via social media. We can get some significant clues for what people are thinking there and use that as a basis on which to pursue these matters beyond the 140 characters on Twitter, for example. I think we can very often get some significant leads from what people are saying on social media. I take a note of that, Martin. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of our students are present here. But you had a second question, which perhaps Claude could tackle first. So it's the best part on the, how the, how the mainstream media. Yes, I, 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 I think we are, we are in a transition state, we're in a stage of, uh, we're not quite, the, the roles are not as quite, quite as clearly defined as they used to be because up to relatively recent history, um, mainstream media was the center of the political universe in terms of political information. And uh, we see, and we heard that a lot of, uh, Dela gave us a lot of data showing how that shift has been taking place. And, and so I, I think that the, the mainstream media did not do a great deal of, did not do as well as it could have um, in discussing some of the issues that some of those raised by Dr. Frampton and, 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 and others. Part, part of it, I believe, uh, may have to do with the, the constant problem, the issue of the, the collision of um, profit and the public interest, which, which, is, a, which, is, a, which, is, a, which is always an, an issue. Um, you remember there's a time earlier in, in, the, in, the, in the campaign when the, 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 the president of um, uh, CBS News uh, said that um, you know Trump may be bad for journalism, but I mean the way they were reporting him, but it, it was good for the bottom line, um, and 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 so it it seems as if in in the search for for audience and relevance, I, I think uh, mainstream media will will, will have to. Um, reconfigure its, its, its approach. I, I agree with Earl that you can have, and you have to have um, long form um, um, programming. In preparing for this um, uh, forum, I did see um, a number of outlets, including the New York Times that got it very badly, the New York, a lot of mainstream media uh, newspapers had extensive um, uh, reporting on some of the, um, the issues uh, confronting uh, the country, but for instance, one of the, 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 the two things that I want to talk about, mainly one is that I've been focusing on today. One is the failure to understand and deal with the apathy. Why were not more people engaged? What were, what were the underlying, why, why were they staying away in what was supposed to be such an important election? What was the failure of the politics and the society um, um, to reach them? Uh, they also, had to address some of those issues uh, raised by Senator Sanders uh, about income inequality and, and all of these things. Um, and and, and I, I think America shied away from those discussions and I think that those are some of the issues that have to be addressed by the media. But then again, as my good friend, the late John Maxwell used to say, um, when the uh, senior journalists and media executives are, are multimillionaires, 
um, in the society, whose side are they on? John says they can't be on the side of the people because, because um, their, their income put them in, the, in that, that one percent. You know, um, they're making $15, $20 million a year as, as, as anchors. Now, that makes them something other than Earl Moxham. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Earl Moxham wants to say something. Yeah, <laughs> just wanted to make an additional point in respect of, um, and, and Martin would not be surprised at my making this particular point, in respect of the capacity of traditional media still to draw on the decades of resources that they have. Um, so during this election campaign, for example, in light of some of the excesses of Trump and his supporters, I don't think enough was made and CBS, the legacy media houses, um, networks, CBS, NBC, ABC, they would have had available in their archives, for example, the excesses of the McCarthy era in the 1950s, the targeting of, of different sectors of the American society, and how some journalists stood up and stood out in denouncing um, the, the excesses of McCarthy and others like him. I think also it might have been useful to go further back, even further back in history and to draw some useful parallels um, I made the point sometime a week or so ago at another forum that the transformational um, presidency of Abraham Lincoln was followed immediately thereafter upon his assassination by the presidency of Andrew Johnson, who turned back many of the achievements that had been um, gained under Lincoln or were scheduled to be gained by the newly enslaved blacks. There is, I mean the newly freed <laughs> blacks. Um, Probably enslaved again. <laughs> almost re-enslaved in terms of what was done to them in the subsequent years. Now, I believe that we need to use the resources available to us in media to make those arguments clear. In a local situation a couple of months ago when it was being proposed by our Attorney General that we should um, engage in some, what some saw as excessive um, legislation to deal with our crime problem, I used the opportunity to go back to the 1960s and 1970s and had a former Minister of National Security and a former Prime Minister making the same proposals to make the point that really the more things change, the more they remain the same, but the impact of playing back words that were spoken to that effect half a century ago, it can have a sobering uh, effect on the society at large and on our policy makers. We have not heard anything about that particular initiative since then. So I think in that respect, again, traditional media in the United States did not use some of the resources that they're at their disposal. So it did not require us um, original reporting in some instances. Okay, so we may are. I, may I, Professor? Uh, may I just add a comment on it? Yes, please. I, I think, unfortunately, I don't exactly share the optimism that mainstream media would change course, so to speak, and begin to focus more on the issues. And I say so for a simple marketing perspective. That especially because it is now being widely recognized that social media is in fact pulling a lot of people to them. It makes traditional media that much more competitive and therefore the desire is to drive business by virtue of what's more sens sensational and less so substance based. And I believe that that is a critical juncture, critical difference between where we are right now, where we'd like to be. It is desirable but I doubt that we will see in the short run. Um, it, they would have to remove the self-interest component of business to be able to get in that direction. Okay, we take one more question from the audience and then we move into the wind-up phase. Craig Peru from the Mona School of Business and Management. After Senator uh, 
Rubio, no, Cruz, fell out of the, the campaign, the primary. The Trump campaign hired Cambridge Analytics, a data science firm from London. And in the Huffington Post today, Jared Kushner says how they used the data scientists that Cambridge Analytics provided and sophisticated techniques from Silicon Valley to win the campaign, Cam uh, to win the elections. Conway, the Trump campaign manager, pointed out that their internal polls suggested that they were likely to win in the weeks leading up to the elections. But yet none of this made its way into the mainstream media before the elections. Do journalists need better training? Do they need to understand more of the data science techniques that are being applied in elections? That's my, my question. Okay, so my answer will be yes. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose I bear some, some um, responsibility to respond to that question and I concur that we need to be more savvy and less traditional in how we are training our practitioners to understand the importance of data journalism, not just of the predominance of opinion journalism, or opinion which predominated, as someone said, for example, CNN, but to go beyond that, but also to understand the science behind a lot of what is taking place called elections. And to do so using some of the social media tools that are available, <coughs> including micro polls that can begin to detect trends in particular demographic groups. So I think our, our emerging media practitioners, and indeed some of our in-house, media house practitioners, <coughs> will need to take on new techniques and new methods in order to give proper coverage to media and to elections of the future. But I don't know that there may be one other person yes, or two yes, who may want to make a comment. Um, clearly, that kind of information that the um, analytical group from, from the UK was generating was running counter. They would be running upstream with that. And it would have been you know, when you have that kind of data, you don't want to generate that and make it public. People think you're really, especially when the odds are so heavily stacked, where 88% of all the polls were suggesting a Clinton victory, you're in the minority. Unless you're really bold and confident about that, you're not going to release it. So it's not strange that you hear it afterwards. Okay. Um, just one quick comment. Craig, I, I think that we're also seeing at the, at the present time the large mainstream media houses investing a lot in data analytics um, and, and, and as part of their data journalism. And so they are using the same algorithms. They are also, refer they are also use it relying on the same people, a lot of the same people at, at Cambridge and also in, in Boston and elsewhere. The, pr the difficulty is that so far, what they're basically focusing on is um, analyzing public poll data to drive their reporting. Now, what, is, what Trump organization did and has done was to, find, was, was to find out where these pockets of support was. Now, now what, what, where I fault mainstream media, if Mr. Trump, against all odds, is turning up late at night in some remote town in in Michigan or, or, or Ohio, as an old time reporter, we used to say, Trump must be onto something. Let's go there and see, find out what is going on. We don't need, so, so, so that the, the reporting instincts should drive them to say if Trump is going, because we, even without knowing that he's, he's being driven by analytics, we should say he, something must be going on in these small towns. Let's put some reporters in there and find out what's going on. So we find out what people are really thinking and saying. But, but yes, I agree, Claude. But you know, it seems also to me that some of the media coverage decisions were being driven by the polls. Mm -hmm. that, that, that they were saying, oh, this looks to be the trend. And therefore, this is what I should be covering. And, and in that scenario, certain 
decisions by Trump to go to certain places may not attract the kind of attention which you are saying it should. And I also glean from what you are saying that old traditional journalism will need to reinvent itself in terms of how it handles the, the election coverage uh, elements of the future, not just social media, but the right. emerging. Just one little thing, one of the things I realized as well was, for the most part, Trump set the agenda. And so um, he positioned the media as being not just anti-Trump. He literally said to his supporters, they're against me, they are against you. So no matter what the traditional media reported in their mind, um, th there, was, there wasn't this level of trust. They felt they were just coming at Trump. They felt. Um, it was incredible when this whole thing about touching women inappropriately came up. I saw men in Jamaica tweeting, come on, that's, that's locker room talk. And so he, could, he pulled this kind of sympathy because Trump made it personal. Trump said, whatever they say, they're attacking me. And I think the more the media went at him, the more it played into what he was doing. The last debate, Trump did something just very nicely, he called Clinton a nasty woman. And when he went on Twitter, nasty woman was trending and Janet Jackson and people were talking about nasty woman, nasty woman. And so the conversation shifted from Trump actually not saying anything useful in the debate to having called Hillary a nasty woman. And so he, he would each time kind of dictate what the conversation would be in the mainstream while, while personally connecting with his supporters through social media. Excellent. Good. So we are, we are moving into the wind-up phase, and we're just going to ask members of the panel to just give us a 30-second or less lesson. <laughs> what can we take away? What can emerging journalists, media practitioners, students, what can we take away? We're going to start with Jennifer Sutton, who we haven't heard much from since she spoke first and then we're gonna move right down to conclude. Thank you very much. I, uh, I've learned a lot tonight. I feel like I wanna take everybody up here out for a beer so that we can <laughs> talk some more. Um, and I really appreciate also the questions from the audience. I, I, I can't comment, uh, I'm forbidden from commenting under US law on the outcome of the election, which is why you haven't heard a lot from me. But I think it's it rings true that um, there's certain themes tonight, you know, the importance of voting, um, the, the challenges facing uh, the media and, and questions of ethics and uh, practical considerations on how to report um, the profit versus, you know, maybe the less profitable uh, investigative journalism. And so I'm, I'm as eager to see what happens in the future as you are, and I, and I really thank you, uh, Professor Dunn, for the opportunity to come here tonight. Thank you. For me, I just want to say I think the, the 2016 presidential election has placed social media um, in a place that we can't ignore. It, it's no longer just a place where people will put pictures and just say hi, bye. It's really a, a very, very active space that as media um, practitioners, we can't overlook. Facebook is unprecedented in the history of the world as, as, as somewhere that people spend time engaging with media. And that should tell you just the importance of it and other social media forms to us as media practitioners. So it's not just there to see, to see from a distance. It really, really is critical to how we engage audiences. Okay. Looking beyond elections and the coverage of elections, uh, from a journalistic standpoint, I think the next five years will be very crucial in respect of how the American society evolves. If we are to take seriously even half of the rhetoric, of the promises, of the threats that were made, then the American society, as we perceive it today, or as we have perceived it for years, that society could change in some significant ways. Most of us have relatives living in the United States. Many of them are citizens of the United States. So what happens in the United States 
will have a direct impact on us from an emotional standpoint, first of all. It could have also have a significant Im impact on us in respect of economic matters in terms of security. I draw to your attention, for example, the emphasis of the Republican Party in respect of gun rights and how the interpretation of those rights could affect us in respect of the ease with which guns move across borders into other societies. Um, the question of the approach of a Trump administration towards matters affecting police-citizen relationship, for example. We already see the person who he has tipped to become his attorney general, somebody that many people are very concerned about. How will a President Trump's law and order agenda be executed in respect of minority groups in the United States. So as far as I'm concerned, the challenge to media in the United States and for those of us who have to report on these developments, I think the call to eternal vigilance rings very loud and clear. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. What has just happened in the United States is of as we know, historic proportions. Never has the United States elected somebody as wealthy as Trump, somebody without any political or military uh, experience. Um, and, uh, and coming to office, defying all of the traditional political assumptions. So uh, going forward, I think we're going to have to pay attention closely to what, is, what, what, what happens. I think um, one of the things I agree with, with Earl, to the extent to which we see any kind of normalization or attempt to normalize um, behaviors and positions and attitudes which were regarded as abnormal and dysfunctional so a short while ago is something that we need to be vigilant about. Um, I think we also need to see how this affects other elections going forward in Germany and France next year because I believe that we may be actually seeing a realignment of the, 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 the global politics. And as a, a small society, um, we can get all caught up into all of that. So that's one thing. Look at what is happening and where it, lead, lead, it leads us. Secondly, I believe, however, that the basic uh, responsibility of journalism, particularly political journalists, uh, remains one of um, telling stories about the candidates, their positions, their proposals, in ways that connect with the majority of voters, and also having some other kinds of conversations that more, more closely integrate what we used to call traditional media and social media. I think the lines are going to be increasingly blurred as people operate in both spaces. And so the future is exciting. <laughs> um, during my presentation, I made reference to the fact that scandals don't really impact um, voter support one way or another. We have a long history of empirical data that points to that from all the way back to net serve scandal through to the post office scandal to whatever scandal. And in January when we released one of our final polls for the RGR group, um, the data suggested that 65% um, of the persons didn't feel that that should have been anything used in the campaign by the, the ruling PNP government. Um, they did to their detriment. Um, we draw, come all the way down to the United States election, and what we saw was a, a significant focus on scandals, on, on negative things. You know, um, the whole question of Trump fondling women and making, you know, the derogatory comments about women, the whole question about the non-payment of his taxes and so on. Um, those things don't really materially impact on people's perception of the individual candidates, as has been seen, right. you know, and that's a very important factor. So if you ask me where traditional media and social media should go in the future and should help to drive the comment and the discussion, it's really towards issues that affect people day in, day out. The whole question about jobs, including about, you know, 
their own financial situation, about their security. These are the issues that are of tremendous importance. And I've found that traditional media and social media to a certain extent fell down in a discussion on these issues to a large extent in the United States presidential election. So going forward, obviously, if these things don't really significantly impact how people vote, why waste so much energy on these issues? And it really is a factor that you need to reflect upon from a traditional media perspective as well as social media because the conversation was a lot about the negatives. It didn't really impact anything. Okay. So friends, you have heard the challenges, the key points, and I want us now just to give our appreciation and thanks to members of the, of the panel. Thank you. Thank you all very much, and thank you for your attention and your participation. I want to thank those from our CARMAC team who helped with the organization of this event and the team from MITS elsewhere in the university that assisted us with some of the technology. Give them a round of applause as well, please. <laughs> thank you all very much. Thank you.